Well, now it's time to turn our attention here in Valencia to the Moto2 Championship in the FIM CEV Repsol International Championships. Another series that has already been won overall, but there's still a battle on for second place. Here we are then in Valencia, as we've mentioned before. Thanks for joining us here. My name's Steve Day, I'm alongside Dylan Gray. Dylan, Jesko Raffin, Swiss rider on the Pons Racing Calix, uh, wrapped up the championship last time out. But there's still quite a tasty battle going on for second place between Florian Alt and uh, Edgar Pons. Well, certainly, I mean, Florian Alt taken out of the out of the uh, run to win the championship. Possibly he was taken out in the final round in uh, Portimao by Xavi Vierge. So that then puts him in that battle with Edgar Pons. He's uh, obviously part of the Pons family, which many people will know from the World Championship with his older brother Axel Pons riding for the AGR team. But certainly they are. They have five points between them, so that's certainly going to be quite a, a juicy battle. Yeah, in a moment we'll show you some uh, action that went on in the last round for Moto2 in uh, Portimao. And uh, there were two races for the uh, Moto2 guys, but we'll bring you action as from the second race. Um, Edgar Pons it was that won the first one. Three hours later in Portugal, it was... Uh, Edgar Pons that would take the lead again and then uh, down into turn one there you can see Edgar Pons that had the early lead during the early stages it was South African uh, Stephen Odendahl that uh, also came through and took the lead briefly but uh, Florian Al, all eyes were on the number 66 rider, of course, looking to try and hunt down Jesko Raffin in the championship. And in this race, it was all about consolidation for Jesko Raffin. He wasn't going for the outright win at all. He was looking to just try and get some points, and it certainly turned out to be all right. There you see number 57, Pons and Odendal at the front. Florian Al, number 66. Pons there really struggling to get his uh, Calix machine stopped, and Odendal then managed to capitalise. This is around the halfway point. Edgar Pons really, really strong on the machine, though. Capitalised on Odendal going wide to retake the lead. At this point, you can see there Florian Alp, who was second in the championship, looking to get himself a win or up into the top three. At least he was having a good battle. Javi, uh, Javi Biergi, Biergi there almost wiping out Edgar Pons down into the hairpin. Florian Alp then managed to capitalise going up into third place. Uh, further back uh, behind these guys, you also had the likes of Alan Tesha, who was having a strong weekend, and it was uh, then a major moment almost for uh, Javi Vierge, who was uh, pretty wild in this second race in Portimao. But then here comes Florian Alp, number 66, up the inside of Steven uh, Odendal, the South African. Things looking good at this point for the German. But this major drama between Vierge and Florian Alp, and that was where the championship was decided. In the end, across the line, it was Edgar Pons that took the win ahead of Odendal, but further back, it was Jesko Raffin that was crowned Moto2 champion. There he is, number 10, the bright orange-red helmet, and uh, that was enough for him to secure his 2014 Moto2 championship. Of course, he will be moving on to the world stage for 2015. Yeah, I think Raffin not quite aware there when he crossed the finish line that he was actually the champion at the time. No, certainly not. Here we are, though, in uh, Valencia for the final round. And despite the fact that Jesko Raffin is uh, the champion, he'll want to go out on a high um, as we see some uh, rather spectacular air shows going on just above us, actually, in the uh, commentary box here at Valencia for the final round, powered by Repsol. Oh, by, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> I wonder whether the pilots also get a year's free fuel like some of our winners do. So. I was actually wondering whether the pilots might be Mark Marquez and Danny Pedrosa <laughs> at one point. But <laughs> no, I've actually seen Danny Pedrosa just go into our commentary box right next to us oh, with okay. our Spanish team. So, no, Danny's doing comment. Might just be the Marquez brothers instead. <laughs> but, uh, no, look, I th you know, this, this though, I think, is absolutely fantastic to... Uh, to a show that this isn't some some little championship that it's you know that that, that you know people really do see this you know it's a, it's a great event you know the C CEV film international repsol we now know it goes abroad it goes to France it goes to Portimao it's getting some good crowds I think we saw some great crowds coming in this morning already just the, even before 10 o'clock we've been graced with fantastic weather here today and of course people want to get their last bike racing fix before the winter
Well, any, anyone questioning the size and stature of the uh, CEV Repsol Championship need look no further than the uh, Moto3 champion Fabio Quattoraro, of course, moving into GPs amongst others. Yep. And then in this championship also, we have Jesko Raffin moving to Moto2. But let's catch up with the front row now. Estamos con Xavi Vierge, Xavi pese a la caída en la segunda carrera de Portimao, cabe decir que estás cojando una magnífica segunda parte de campeonato. Sí, cada vez estamos un pelín más cerca del top y bueno, ahora falta rematar la faena. Los entrenamientos estamos bien adelante, pero en carrera no acabamos de afinar las últimas vueltas, aquí hay que mejorarlo. Suerte, gracias. That was uh, Chubby Vierge there telling us that, yes, he has been improving towards the end of the season, but now he, he needs to translate all the work that he's doing in the practice sessions into more of a race result. So he certainly hopes he can do that here himself, qualifying on pole position the fastest time of a 1.37.356. And then here we now talk to the championship winner, Jesko Raffin. Segundo y estrenando título, Jesco Raffin, qué mejor manera sería de estrenar título y despedirte del FIMCEA Prepsol de Moto2 que con una victoria, ¿no? Sí, claro, que ahora ya, ya tengo el título y no tengo que arriesgar mucho, pero yo, yo quiero ganar las carreras, quiero dar siempre todo y a ver si puedo terminar la temporada con una victoria. Here we have a champion, Jesko Raffin, telling us, look, yes, I'm the champion. I'm certainly not going to risk too much. We do know he's going to be moving up to the SAC team in the Moto2 World Championship next year. However, he did say it would, of course, uh, will, of course, be nice if he can go out with a championship win, though that's certainly not going to be easy with the kind of field he's got in front of him. And here we are now with third place man, Stephen Odendahl. David Odendahl, could this be the first the time to uh, achieve your first victory in the FMC Brepsol? Yeah, you know, I want to try and um, push for the front, uh, the top step in the podium. Let's see what uh, the race has. There's a lot of wind and a lot of things that can happen, but let's see full gas and uh, hope for my first one. Thanks, well, good luck. no need for, for translation there, but interesting to say that the wind does uh, does seem to have picked up this morning. We know there certainly wasn't an awful lot. I know when Moto3 first started, there was maybe uh, maybe these planes are creating some of that some of that turbulence down there on the grid. <laughs> maybe so, but either way, they're putting on a spectacular show for uh, the uh, the locals that have come to uh, watch this final CEV. Repsol Championship ran. Jesko Raffin it is then that uh, has won the championship overall. One interesting point that we uh, brought up um, yesterday when we were chatting about Jesko Raffin here, despite the fact that he's kind of pressure off now, he's the champion, he's got some tests coming up that may be rather important, so he won't want to be putting too much into this you won't want to put you know won't want to make too many risks etc no i mean you know that that's why in the in the grid interview he was he was almost keen to a stress to like take that expectation off and say look i don't want to risk it yes of course i do want to finish with a win but i don't really want to risk anything but here's someone like we saw alan tesher we just saw the fourth place man the number 89 he's also been in the world championship before in moto three has one second place and three third places so you know, him coming to a track which he knows fairly well certainly could be one of the threats for the uh, for the front guys. Yeah, Alan Tasha, you may of course remember, the former Moto3 GP rider. One of the big problems for him this year has been the inconsistency and the no scoring in some of the rounds. It's not a 20-round championship, so, you know, you get a DNF in this series and you're in real trouble in terms of trying to get yourself into the top three overall. No, certainly, certainly. Then we had uh, Luca Vitali. Some people might recognise uh, his dad. His, uh, his dad actually works with, uh, with Valentino Rossi. He's one of the people managing his, uh, his helmets. Uh, Nicely the, worded. Yeah. <laughs> you avoided. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Moving on quickly, here we have Florian out, the man in fight for second place in the championship with Edgar Pons. Incredibly tall, the German rider. Very, very tall guy. He was too big for the Moto3 class, which is uh, Moto3 World Championship, which is why he stepped down to Moto2 in the CV. But he will be back in the World Championship next year on with Iota on a suitor machine. 
Here is the starting grid then for this Moto2 19 lap race. It's uh, Xavi Vieja who will start from pole position ahead of the champion Esco Raffin and then Steven Odendahl uh, going full gas, as he says, uh, third on the grid. Alan Tesche then ahead of Vitali and Florian Alt. Ed Gapons then further behind the cut for him. And in row four, we start with American Momola, uh, sorry, Dakota Momola, son of Randy Momola. Right next to him, we have Bastien Chizot, Diego Perez, just behind Ed, uh, sorry, Lucas Troutman, then Mikel Pons and Andres Gonzalez. And in row six, we have Alex Sirol, Valentin Debis and Bertin Thibault. Yes, don't forget, folks. Don't forget, folks, that we have uh, Super Stock 600 runners within the Moto2 race, and we'll keep you up to date as to how they're getting on. Paleso there ahead of Arroyo and Remy. And uh, further back there, Zinni and Bernardi, the Italians, just up ahead of Mangas number 15 there on row 12. And then finally, we end up with Swiss rider Stefan Fressa, Adrien Bonastra and Anton Emmerin right next to him. And then the final row we have, uh, we have Henning Falthaug, Melissa Paris, the American and Roberto Bernardi rounding out the grid. Here we go then, the Moto2 riders getting themselves prepared for this warm-up lap there. You can see uh, Luca Vitali, number 70, just up alongside Jesko Raffin, who uh, has uh, that sort of slightly different helmet design after winning his championship. Yeah, and very, very interesting bike for Luca Vitali. He has the Ariane, that's a bike that we don't see in the World Championship. He's got a very, very wide front fairing, but the actual seat unit is incredibly skinny, which is some, which is almost the opposite that we see with some of the suitors and the Calyxes, which often go a bit thinner at the front, but then actually modify the back, try and make the back of the bike almost a touch bigger. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons why they do that is, is to stop other riders trying to get that, get that slipstream behind them. So one thing I do love about the CV Repsol is that we we do have some some fantastic new bike designs we know the rules are a little bit open and, and that we've got people really trying to experiment yeah well we'll certainly discuss that throughout this race there's uh, various likenesses and uh, topics that we can bring up about this championship so far this year but either way we can tell you the Jesko Raffin will be moving into Moto2 you mentioned Florian out there of course too tall to really get to grips with the Moto3 he was of course 2012 Red Bull Rookies Champion yes, so and, and IDM Champion uh, won the German Championship so, as well there's, yeah there's a lot of people that still say okay he's got unfinished business here in the World Championship when he makes his return do you know he, he grew 12 centimetres in one season he That's came into Moto3 he grew 12 centimetres if anyone at home has a ruler, I think 12 centimetres is what, about five, five, six, six inches? No, five inches roughly, I think, in, in one year. It's just absolutely incredible. So even for a Moto2 bike, I'd still say he's almost a touch too tall. But, you know, these guys, we're seeing a lot of tall and very skinny riders out there now, which we know might be hindered a little bit on the top speed. But in terms of throwing a weight around on the bike, especially change in direction, does seem to help them that much more when they're on these heavier machines. And in terms of uh, Edgar Pons, another rider that I just want to bring up, uh, third in the championship, number 57, of course, brother to Axel Pons, a son of Sito Pons. Yeah. Um, not been racing actually that long no, but very second, talented second year in road racing only his second year in road racing and he's already fighting for second place in the moto 2 cv championship but big motocross background and uh, this is something i think you mentioned in the practices steve he looks comfortable on an uncomfortable bike absolutely he, he looks yeah. happy when the thing's completely out of shape and especially looking up towards moto gp if that's his ultimate aim that could hold you in very good stead here we go then, there's uh, Xavi Vieja getting himself prepared uh, on pole position. The rider that uh, effectively got involved in that crash that ended Florian Alt's chances of winning the Moto2 Championship this year. Well, yes, yeah, so no, no love lost between those two now. And, uh, you know, you do wonder if Vieja could once again be the guy to, to mess things up in that fight for, for second place. He's more, he's just more than 25 points behind those, uh, behind second and third. So he's technically, he's got nothing to lose. He just wants to win. He just wants to win. He's won one race this season, which was in Navarra, and he certainly want to go out on another one. Pole position for number 97, Vieja. Second place for the champion, Jesko Raffin. Third there, number 44, Steven Odendahl. And away from the line, we go. Really good start from the South African. Third on the grid as we shoot down towards turn one. And it's going to be the number 44, surely, that gets the whole shot. Number 44, Steven Odendahl, will lead into turn one ahead of... That's somebody coming from way back, not on the first row. Certainly, Jesko Raffin is now trying to get himself no, up into second place. That was Miroslav Popov. That looks like Miroslav Popov got a very... Very good start there, but we have oh, the fast wide. Pons. 
Yep, just gone wide, but we've got the first ponds, but up the inside and... Oh, there's and a we, few riders sitting up there. We've avoided a fall, that's, that's good news, that's the good news. Yeah, it's a few riders really struggling to get their way around turn two, further back there. You see 72, Roberto Bernardi, and uh, oh, there's number 37 out of the race, Fabrizio Perrin, the Argentine, and that's the end of his race already. So yeah, uh, here we... at the front, back up at the front, looks like we have... We have Jesko Raffin, we have Jesko Raffin, the championship winner, already leading the race, followed by Xavi Vierge and Steven Odendal behind. So great start from Odendal, but he did get swallowed up a tiny little bit. As we saw on the grid a little earlier on, uh, Steven Odendal yet to win a race in this category, and he would dearly love to end the season with a race victory overall. Odendal fifth in the championship. Uh, he would need a win and Vierge to have a problem here to actually end up getting uh, a further place up in the championship overall but at the moment it is the champion uh, Jesko Raffin is doing exactly what he said he wouldn't do Ooh. oh and that's a massive crash there further back and that is that that's, Alan that's Tesha Alan Tesha that's Alan Tesha with oh, the number 89 monster monster Mike. crash there unfortunately oh, that, and that was in was that Florian out that he was involved with there possibly further back I'm not sure it almost looks like he like he lost the bike that it bit again and then and then threw him off and threw him off we can just see out of our window we've got the Yep, he's still he's still down, unfortunately. But it looks look. I can I can tell you that he's back on his knees now. We can see that from afar. So that's uh, that's some good news. I think he might have just there. be a bit knocked out to begin with. There, you know, windy, yeah, yes. slightly winded or something. But he is getting up and he's walking away. Meanwhile, out front, uh, lap two of 19. It is Jesko Raffin that has this lead. There's Tesha now walking up and away. Oh, that would have. Uh, Knock the wind out of his sails for sure. Oh, certainly, and we now have uh, Miroslav Popov up into fourth place. He's managed to get past Luca Vitali, and it already looks like in these very early stages we've got this group of five already pulling away at the front, and then just behind we have the number 55 of Alejandro Medina. So leading this race, the champion Jesko Raffin, uh, Pons Racing Calex, the 18-year-old. CEV Moto2 champion for this season in his 10th race now. Five podiums, five wins so far. Yep, and he's going to be wanting to run a controlled race. Like you said, don't, don't try and risk anything. He is, of course, going to want to go out with the win, but he knows he is going to be testing with, with, the, uh, with the SAG team who is going to be joining for that World Championship next year. So it's a case of don't do anything stupid, but still put on a good show. For the fans, I think the man with absolutely nothing to lose here is Xavi Vierge, the 17-year-old. One win, one second place, two third places. Um, and I think Raffin will be very aware of what Vierge did to Alt in the in the previous race. And you wonder how comfortable he'll be having him right behind. Although it looks like Odendal, no, Odendal could not quite make it past down the straight. Well, the other thing about uh, Xavi Vierge, number 97, is the fact that he's sort of come out of nowhere. He was 26th overall in the Moto3 Championship last year. Well, in insiders in the paddock here said Vierge had one of those growth spurts which uh, you could argue was a bit, a bit like Florian out but instead of just going up he also grew shoulders and uh, he, oh, and he's, now, he's, guy, and and he's now taking the lead lovely move there ahead of Jesko Raffin as we're talking about him right now um, Sorry to interrupt you there, Dylan, but no, no, uh, Vier here up the inside there of Jesko Raffin to take the lead. Well, look, we were just talking, he's grown, he, he, he got taller, he got more muscular, he gained far too much weight for Moto3. They say he was a great talent when he was little, and it's just that size that, that hindered him, and he's really come good towards the end of this season, and he's really showing that talent. And look, he knows, he knows Raffin will not want to do anything stupid, will not want to risk anything. This is his chance. This is a massive chance here for Vieja. He has already won a race hit so far this season, but he's looking to try and put himself uh, out there and show what he's got at the age of 17 as well. That is impressive. Stephen Oldendahl, number 44, another rider that's been uh, in the GP frame a couple of times, not quite worked out for him, but he's had a strongish season. Oh, definitely, definitely. I think, uh, you know, a lot of guys that often go up into into GP maybe a little bit early. You say, look, do a year in the uh, in the FIMC V Repsol is gonna is gonna do you an absolute world of good. One thing, of course, we do have to mention, we have the the big difference. Whereas Moto3, these guys can make a straight switch. The guys here are on Michelin tires. They're not on Dunlop tires like in the World Championship, which is why we don't often see wild cards coming in from this class and doing very very well. Um, obviously, they they do well, but they they've really got to adapt to these tires. And I think. 
Steve, you're the man who's actually ridden a big variation of tyres. It's uh, the, the Michelins have a reputation for being a bit softer. Well, certainly back when I was racing, Michelins were tend to be very, very grippy. And then once they lost grip, it was like falling off the edge of a cliff. Whether that's the same now, I'm not quite sure. But when you hear from riders, it certainly seems that way. Yeah. Dunlops tend to be a little harder. Uh, you get uh, far more forgiving um, as, uh, you know, so there's various ways of getting it. Either way, two very different types of tyres. Yeah, and then we saw uh, Alex Rins, the uh, ex, uh, ex, now ex-Moto3 rider with the Pons team in Moto2. He's obviously there to, to cheer on Edgar for the uh, f for second place in the championship and uh, Jessica Raffin for the race. It'll be fascinating to see how, uh, how Alex Rins goes on that bigger bike because he's also very tall. They all they all seem to be being fed on, on something different these days because they're not short guys bike races anymore. They're tall and skinny. No, they certainly are. Um, Vierke here is still leading this race, though, from Raffin, and then Odendal and Merislav pop off. You can see there, number 95 uh, on that suitor machine, the yellow and black bike, really is closing in now. The 19-year-old rider from the Czech Republic made numerous wildcard appearances in Moto3 and 125 GP over the years. Yep, and in terms of the uh, in terms of the lap times, it's uh, it's uh, Vierge who last time out was fastest. He's dropped his time now to a 37.8, but we're also seeing Jesko Raffin oh. up the pace, and that was that pop off slipping oh. Oh, into third down wow. in turn one. He was, do you know, that was it, he backed it into turn one after going up the inside, and he's absolutely furious with himself. It looked like a good move to begin with. Here you can see he was just struggling to get the bike stopped, Dylan, and in the end, decks it out, loses the front end. And uh, that's uh, the end of the race for so him. So unfortunate. I mean, he did a did a white. He crashed out of both of his um, Moto2 wildcards in the World Championship in Bruno and Misano. And, and you know, look, he's he's shown he's a talented rider in just these short number of laps and four laps being up there with the, with such a strong leading group. So real, real shame for the Czech rider. Yeah, he walks away, and unfortunately, that's it for him for 2014. And he'll have to regroup now and come back fighting again next season. It's uh, Xavi Vieja that leads from Jesko Raffin, the champion, 2014. Now, so Stephen Odendal uh, resumes in third place, although there's a bit of a gap now between the top two and Odendal in third. Well, exactly. I mean, for me, the worrying thing is, well, Florian Alt and Edgar Pons are not up there with those runners, but they are together. They're yep. in sixth and seventh place. Now, the man who needs to score more points is Edgar Pons. Edgar needs to beat Florian Alt. Well, needs to get five points on him because Edgar has won two races compared to Florian Alt's one. So should they be tied on points, it will be Edgar who wins. But Edgar still needs to get at least five points more than Alt, which at the moment, well, being behind him, he certainly won't do. But even if he overtakes him, he still needs to go up the ranks a little bit more. Across the line there, we see Jesko Raffin closing in on Javi Vierge. These are the top two. This is third place man, number 44, Stephen Odendal. And then behind Stephen Odendal is that battle that Dylan was referring to between Edgar Pons, number 57, and Florian Alt, number 66. And uh, for there is Luca Vitali actually sandwiched in between them at the moment. They are fighting for second in the championship, both Alt and uh, Edgar Pons. Well, yeah, and looking looking at the times, they're just they're just not quite up there with their pace. I mean, especially um, especially we had Florian Alt. He's in a, he's with an early 138, and um, and Edgar Pons. Well, actually, Edgar Pons is with a, is with a 37.7. So now uh, so now it really is Pons who's uh, who's up there with Vitali just between them. So Pons looking very strong, and this could be risky for Alt. It could be, although I think Alt might have just made a move and gone up the inside of Luca Vitali. We'll see, uh, get confirmation of that in a moment. Meanwhile, back to the front we go. There is uh, Xavi Vieja up ahead of uh, Jesko Raffin. Raffin's got this lovely, smooth riding style. Doesn't seem to ever really look like he's in much trouble, but he's certainly quick. And this group now starting to bunch up a bit. Now has got past Luca Vitali, yeah, so now well, he hunts down Edgar Pons again. He's got to, he's got to. He can't He can't risk losing too many points. If uh, if Pons is looking comfortable, which he does, then, then Alp will at least lead to stick on his rear wheel and, and at least try and pip him towards the end. This is going to be one of those where the team is going to have to be so, so precise with the pit board to say look yes you need to risk the overtake or no you don't you know because uh, as we saw in the super bikes you, you know until the end so many things can still happen with the points table yeah it is though at the front still no change uh, Xavi Vieje on the motorsport Targo Bank uh, 
Tech 3 machine is leading from the Pons Calex there of Jesko Raffin. Odendal keeping them honest in third place. Number 44 on the AGR team speed up. 21 year old. Three podiums this year, looking for his first win. And Edgar Pons closing on those front four. He's closing. He's just done the fastest lap of the race, a 137.464. And do you know what? He has he has what we call the Moto2 riding style. He backs that bike in, they say. That is how you need to run it. And we've just seen a crash. I wonder if that looked yes. like a super stock machine in, in yeah, the back there. Yeah, I think it was a couple of super stock machines uh, further back. But by, by the way, it's uh, Thibault that leads that super stock battle. He's in 12th place overall ahead of Corey Turner. But it's uh, Vieji that leads this one. But we are going to have some battle in a moment. Edgar Pons is the man on the move in fourth place. Number 57 who's uh, 19 and he was 10th overall in the CEV Championship last year, looking for second this season. And closing now onto the tail of the red bike, number 44. And Florian Alt is catching this group also, Dylan. Number 66, you can see in there, sort of turquoise colour scheme with a bright yellow number board. 66, he's got orange leathers on. Right, mixed mixture colour <laughs> yeah. scheme there. But uh, he's absolutely massive on that bike. He's he's huge, absolutely huge. And But, you know, I think... Like we say, and uh, you know, tall, tall guys from the GP paddock, even like uh, Scott Redding, or I think from Superbikes, you'll uh, you'll be aware, Leon Camier. They sometimes say, yes, you lose out, maybe a bit in acceleration, maybe a bit in the straight, but in terms of shifting your weight about, it works very well. And here we have Edgar Pons really sniffing right behind Rat. Uh, uh, excuse me, right behind Desco Ruff in there. It does look like it's more a case of rather when than if he's going to get past. Well, Stephen Odendahl was able to get past Jesko Raffin on the start finish straight to move up into second place. And Jesko Raffin here going to be in a bit of trouble. We've got waved yellow, so you can't overtake under them. But uh, Edgar Pons looking to make a move here on his teammate and the champion of Moto2. There is Florian Alt. Really has capitalised here on this group, tripping each other up. There's still bikes down in the background there. Uh, so still waved yellows. So yeah, it is that still leads. Odendahl looking good here in second place. Jesko Raffin is almost holding up Edgar Pons and Alt at the moment. I think so. I mean, you could, you know, uh, you could argue that he's not doing his teammate any favours there whatsoever. Really, he'd want to be getting between those guys and then holding up and then holding up Florian out because it does look like both Raffin and Alt have a very good pace. I mean, Ed Capon showed us last time out. He set that fastest lap. He was one of the few to go into the one. 137s, uh, so did throwing out. Everyone else was up in the 138. So, you know, whether it is that, that Vierge, you can't imagine him that, that he'd be holding it up. He's got nothing to gain from that. He's got nothing to gain from those guys really falling up. He just wants to win this race. He wants to go out on a high. The same with o Odendal hasn't won. He almost won in Jerez. And then I, th I believe it was part of the swing arm linkage system that broke. His bike just buckled and he couldn't win that race. And ever since then, it's, oh, it's just not worked. Oh, that's Vieje. And he runs out of room there on the exit of turn one. Sorry to interrupt, Dylan, but Vieje there has rejoined back in fifth place. And that means that Ondal, just as you were talking about it, now does lead so on lap nine of 19. Wasn't the commentators curse in that case for, <laughs> for the man we were talking about? But look, this is going to be so interesting to see what the pace is going to be doing because Vierge was clearly pushing, um, you know, trying to up his pace, but was in the high 138s. Odin Dahl was a, was a couple of tens faster, so it'll be interesting to see whether th whether this can snake out ever so slowly. But look, Alt is uh, Alt is past uh, is past Pons. This is such a great story. The Moto2 racing in the CEV Championships have been battling all year long, and Odin Dahl here is in a position where he could win his first race. Jesko Raffin in second is the champion already and uh, will surely be trying to help out his teammate to second overall. It's Florian Alt in third place. So at the moment, at the moment, Alt would be taking second place in the championship purely because he's leading. Now, should that position change, should Edgar Pons manage to get into that position of fourth place, even that would not be enough to, to take the championship. He needs to have a buffer of five points. He needs five points. Javi, uh, Javi Vierge is still just in the mix there in fifth place. He's, he'll probably be able to catch this group up because they are tripping each other over. And then further back, we've got uh, Luca Vitali in sixth place, Troutman seventh, and Dakota Mamola in eighth place. Uh, Valentina de Bees, by the way, number 31 in ninth. It was a late addition to the program. As we go across the line now and into turn one, it is still Odendahl from Raffin, but Alt looking like he wants to make a move here. Yep, had a sniff up the inside. I mean, he would... 
you you wonder what would happen. I mean, look, he's just yes, oh, he is going to get nice up move. the inside of Raffin. Typical overtaking place there into turn number two. Like we said many times, is a lot tighter than it looks on TV. They've got to get very hard onto the brakes as they tip it in onto the left, and it looks like Odendahl is going to be his next victim. He's really on a roll now. Florian out there and has really regrouped after a bit of a tough start for the German. It didn't really look like it was going to go his way in the early stages. He's had a lot of ground to make up. He's managed it. He's now in second place, number 66. So what will happen further behind them as Jesko Raffin currently in third place. Edgar Pons, his teammate number 57, will now have to find a way past. Well, will there be any team orders? That's that's the big question. Do you let the champion race his final race or do you say, look, you know, because as we say for the teams, it's important. The teams need these points. They need these standings. Unless Raffin truly believes he's quicker and he can and he can keep Edgar Pons uh, up there, maybe give him a toe. But if we're looking at this now, Alt is looking up for, you know, he's looking for a way up the inside of Odendahl. I, I wouldn't say that Jesko Raffin at the moment looks like a man that could actually win this race. He doesn't quite have that pace. And of course, that's not to say that he doesn't deserve the championship, but at the moment, he just doesn't need to win. It's as simple as that. He'll be thinking about 2015 already. Oh, yes. Uh, but at the moment, he's in third place and he's in the way. Now we'll be seeing if he maybe gets any team orders from his pit board. But across the line we go. Odendahl has a look over his shoulder. That will lose you some time, <laughs> I'm afraid. And now Florian out. Oh, there's oh, some debris there's in the middle of the circuit there. Um, is there a lack of adhesion flag? There's a green flag waving after it, just to say you're clear after that. But there's a bit of debris. If you were to pull out of the slipstream and not see that, no, it could be course, a bit nasty. Course. Down into turn two we go. Odendahl, number 44. 66 is out. Then it's Raffin, number 10, the champion. I mean, Raffin just, just looks to be riding, as you say, very, very smooth kind of rider. And it must be so tough to a pass because, he, you know, he looks to be riding almost very defensive. He's, uh, he's, he's closing up all those corners there. But he... But also Odendahl, Odendahl very, very strong there. I, I almost would have thought that, that Alt would have made his move by now, but it's just obviously not quite as easy as it, uh, as it maybe looks from a commentary position. But for me, the biggest worry would be Edgar Pons because he looked very strong, he's looked fast, he still holds the fastest lap. Oh, Let's see, can he make his move up the inside? I'd no. say he's still got a, a bit left in the tank here, Dylan. It's just a, a matter of trying to get past his teammate. We've mentioned already throughout today here at Valencia, and you'll have mentioned it a lot last week in MotoGP, it's a tough circuit to overtake on. Yes. The middle section, you have to get things nailed on. Oh, and that's the sort of thing, that's the sort of opportunity that sometimes opens up. If you go slightly wide, you lose your concentration, that is your chance. And Edgar Pons there in fourth, just looking a bit frustrated, you can see from his body language on the bike. Yeah, yeah, he needs to find a way past, but Moto2, we sometimes say, look, running, oh, throwing out, is he going to, no, not quite up, up the inside, Odendahl very, very late there on the brakes, so, and he actually went into that final turn a little bit wide. Well, he's going to line him up now, I'm sure. I think he's got some decent drive out of the final turn, Dylan. He's going to go up into the slipstream, and now he's got a ping out. That's his chance, and Florian Out will surely go into the lead. No, it didn't quite work. Great oh, breaking from Odendahl. Break. But now be interesting turn two, because Alton would maybe have slightly more momentum coming out of that turn. Can Odendahl square it off? No, he's done well there, Rodendahl, to hold on to his lead for now. Uh, in third place is still Jesko Raffin, so if he has been given a team order, I don't think he will have been given anything. No, probably you know. not, probably not, but I think that's some great riding there from Odendahl because he's clearly looking like the slower rider at the moment, out all over the back of him. But, yeah, he's having to ride so defensive, be so late on the brakes. You do wonder just how long how long they can uh, they can keep that kind of riding up for. And, and Raffin just just almost seems relaxed at the uh, at, at the back of the group there. And like you say, you just hope Edgar Pons isn't going to get frustrated and do any, uh, you know, do anything stupid. Oh, here comes Florian Alt, and he's going to nudge Odendahl wide there, but he's managed to make a move stick in a corner that's very difficult to pass on. Really good move there from the German. Florian Alt leads then, number 66 up ahead of Stephen Odendahl. And this is now going to be the warning sign to Edgar Pons saying, you now have to get past your teammate, you have to get past Odendahl, and you now have to win the race because if it was to be Edgar Pons finishing first and Florian out in second, then yes, it certainly would be Edgar Pons taking that title because he'd have the five points differential. But if Florian out is ahead of him still at these stages, Pons doesn't stand any kind of chance, so he's going to have to work hard. And out looked about a tenth or two faster than Odendahl, so you know, you never know, is he going to be able to maybe pull away? Well, we'll uh, find out very shortly. We're on lap uh, 13 of 19, and the great thing about these uh, races. 
Um, they're so, so close at the front. I don't know where those 13 laps have just gone no. uh, across the line then. <laughs> Florian Alt it is that has the advantage. Odendal in second. Raffin here regrouping in third. Looking smooth. Ed Capons at the moment, despite being frustrated, I'm sure, isn't doing anything too silly. Uh, just waiting for his moment. Yeah, but he'll but be look, frustrated Alt, without Alt's leading by away. so much. Alt is starting to pull a little bit of a lead. He's been quicker in that, that last lap. And Pons is going to be very, very aware of that. But no way past Raffin at the moment. You know, Raffin doesn't even look to be threatening Odendal as of yet. You do wonder in terms of tyre drop-off what's, uh, what's going to be happening with these bikes. We know from the Moto2 class in the World Championship where they run the Dunlop tyres that actually we often see uh, faster lap times towards the end. And here we have Raffin up the inside of Odendal. Can Edgar Pons capitalise on that? No, he's gone wide. Can Odendal fight back up into turn nine? No, it doesn't no. quite work out. It's tricky to get back past there. So it is uh, Jesko Raffen, the, rain, or the new uh, CEV Repsol Moto2 champion that has moved up into second place now. Ondal dropped back to third. Edgar Pons in fourth. Maybe Edgar might sense an opportunity coming here. In terms of tyre drop-off that you were just mentioning, that certainly happened to Javi Bierre, who's further back in fifth. After that mistake, he's just not been able to get back up with the group again. Yeah. I mean, also you, from a rider's point of view, I'm sure you know that once that happens, maybe in that certain turn, you maybe lose just a little bit of confidence, maybe go at half a ten slower at that corner than you would have done before. Well, there's also the, the case of saying you're leading the race and now you want to try even harder. And when you try harder, sometimes yeah. it doesn't quite work out. Either way, Bierre... His chances of winning this race are slipping away. He's uh, well back now, but it's Florian Alt that's doing the job out front. The only man into the 137s on that last lap ahead of Jesko Raffin. Then Odendal is now coming under a bit of pressure, number 44 on the red machine. Uh, up ahead of Edgar Pons, who's lining something up into yeah. turn four. Doesn't quite work there. Well, yeah, that was some spectacular style of Edgar Pons going into turn one. Like we say, got that motocross style really backing the bike in, really pointing it out towards towards the exit of the corner. That's, they say, how you need to ride these Moto2 bikes. They don't have the horsepower of the bigger machine, so the longer you can make corner exit, the quicker you can get on the gas, and that's how you really benefit from it. But it could be here, it could be here down into turn eight, where no, he's not quite close enough. No, he's just trying to line up a move here. Odendal did run slightly wide on the, uh, the apex of the last turn, but he's, there's no room for a manoeuvre there as Odendal holds on to third place and Edgar Pons there in fourth. Edgar Pons, oh, oh that was tight. Edgar's best chance here is either going to have a look up the inside into the last turn or get himself a nice line so he can get in the slipstream. I think he needs to show Odendal his front wheel a bit more. He needs to make him nervous. He needs to put him under pressure because at the moment I think he's waiting for the invitation. I think he needs to be that tiny little bit closer. Of course he doesn't want to risk a, uh, risk a crash but you know maybe just try and put him under pressure that little bit more. In terms of uh, road racing he's not got quite as much experience as uh, some of the riders ahead of him, all of these riders are pretty young, but of course, as we mentioned before, it's motocross that he's come out of. Ondal here under pressure then as we come around turn one. Now we look towards Pons in fourth as we go up to turn two. He's not close enough to make a move. No, and I mean, uh, Odendal is just squaring those corners off. You know, he's taking a very, very defensive line. He knows that he's not quite as fast. And you can tell, look, he's, he's slowing them down. At the front, we have Alt, Alt and Raffin running in the 137s and it's Odendal in the low 138s. And, that, and that's obviously where, where Edgar Pons is as well. And so as we stand at the moment, Florian Alt would keep second place in the championship and uh, Edgar Pons would be in third as, it's, as it was before the race. It's Florian Alt that leads this race, second place overall in the championship. The German ahead of Jesko Raffen, Swiss rider, the champion crown in Portimao. I just wonder whether Jesko Raffen, having not done anything too dramatic in this race, has saved his tyres enough to maybe um, put on a bit of an attack at the end. Well, he's been he's been so smooth, like you say, and, and I think smoothness, lots of people will talk about, you know, they they say, well, that that's obviously tyre conservation. Someone like Pons, who's got that more aggressive style, he might be struggling that little bit more towards the end. Like we say, when it's Dunlops in the, uh, in, in the World Championship, we often see the fastest laps towards the end. The tyres seem to come good, but I've spoken to some of these riders who've done the wild cards in there and they say Dunlops are much harder. So with these Michelins, they're a bit softer. Argue a bit of a drop-off, but not quite so much. Here we have Australian Corey Turner. Oh, and he's just lost the front there, unfortunately for him, and he's picking up the bits of his bike. 
Um, back to the garage, I'm sure, for him, and that's the end of the Australian season, sad for him. Meanwhile, further back, it's Thibbo that currently leads to Superstocks. This is your battle, however, for third place. Stephen Oldendahl, number 44, and Edgar Pons. The pair of them just dropping back from this group. I fancy, you know, Jesko Raffin to just be closing in a bit here on flowing out the last two laps he's been, he's a, couple been a couple of, couple of tenths. tenths faster yeah mm. oh, oh there we go have. nice move edgar pons up into third place then into turn four uh, Odendahl left the door open then now has edgar pons got anything left in the tank there's only a few laps left two and a half laps remaining that's going to be a big big ask from the young spaniard but he's shown he's got the quality he's shown he's got the speed like you said steve what has he got in his, uh, in his tank, both personally and in terms of tyres. Well, one thing he does have in his favour is that if there are any team orders and if he's going to get some help from Jesko Raffin, if Raffin was able to get out front of this race and maybe just hold up Florian out, then we could be in for a spectacular final few laps. Yeah, because out, out winning gives out second place regardless of what Edgar Pons does. Edgar Pons needs to beat Florian out. He really needs to, uh, you know, really needs to, to get in front. And I think that's going to be very, very tough. So you'd argue you'd almost need to get Raffin to get in front of uh, of Alt, then get Pons to get in front of Alt, and then let Raffin let Pons in front. Slightly, yeah. slightly tricky on the mass there, but oh, I'm with you, just about. <laughs> 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 Onto the, st um, the start finish straight we go to start set lap 17 of 19, and again we go across the line, and again Raffin is slightly quicker than Alt. There's yellow flags waving into turn one, so an incident further back. There's Edgar Pons in third place, and that was uh, a 38-1 from him, so he is faster than the men ahead of him, but not fast enough. He needs to find more than that. Uh, this is a fan fantastic shot there of Adrian Bonastra on a, on a bike labelled La Moto Dos. So the Moto2, fantastic design. Look at the front there. It's got a real A-frame. It's, it's not a regular front fork. It's essentially a suspended A-frame. Then you have a coilover spring down to the right-hand side. Um, it's you know fantastic to see certain types of uh, you know different kind of innovation in this class. We also have the same thing with the trans transformers machine, not transformers, transformers <laughs> machine uh, that that are runs a uh, runs a very different style front as well. Because as we know, this class they all run the same uh, they run the same engines in the bike. So that so the development all comes around the chassis. Also, they have the same tyres. So it's all chassis development. And you know I. I myself have a bit of an engineering background and you know I'm a bit of a bike enthusiast from that point of view so I really love seeing that you've got people trying new things. Well it certainly uh, looks a bit different out on the circuit here in Valencia. Meanwhile at the front here Florian Alt might be coming under some pressure shortly from Jesko Raffin. I don't think we're close for business just yet. This could be quite close because Edgar Pons is the man to look out for in third. Has he got any chance at all of catching these guys? We'll find out in a moment. On to the start finish straight to start the penultimate lap of this Moto2 race. I think Raffin needs to get in the way of Alt. He needs to slow it down by, by creating some kind of battle. That's the only way I think Edgar Pons is going to be. Oh, although well, they're saying that. Looking at the times, thanks to you just looked at that, a 137.6 is over half a second faster than the guys at the front. He's bringing Stephen Odendahl with him as well. We could have some jaw-dropping finish going on here. Florian Alt at the moment leads this race and will become the runner-up. Uh, will hold on to the runners up place that he's currently got in the Moto2 Championship. Jesko Raffin, the champion there in second place, looking to try and get out front. And Edgar Pons there in third. He'll need uh, quite a few changes to go on between now and the finish line. But if he's to get himself up to second overall in the Championship, and Stephen Odendahl, as we mentioned before, yet to win a race in this class. And he'll be desperately hoping that maybe Jesko Raffin can get himself embroiled in some sort of a battle with Florian Alt. Well, exactly. Now what we have, a lap and a half, from, no, even less. No, no, about a lap and a half remaining. And, um, yeah, what's, uh, what can you really ask for? It's, it's got to be, now, for me, it's more in the hands of, of Raffin than anyone. He needs to rough up Florian Alt. If, that's, you know, if those are the team orders, it would be rough him up. That's the only way it's going to happen because Alt technically needs to finish third with, um, with Edgar Pons um, in, in front. Here we go around turn 13, number 72, there is Roberto Bernardi, he's about to get lapped, and Ed 
back. Uh, uh, sorry, the Esco Raffin. Oh, the back marker's got in the way there, and they're going either side. And now they're side by side, and it's going to be Esco Raffin that takes the lead here. We're about to begin the final lap of the Moto 2 race, and Florian out, and oh, uh, the Esco Raffin are elbows out, and Edgar Pons is catching the pair of them. This is going to be a dramatic final lap. Esco Raffin, the champion, takes the lead into turn one, and Alt now going to try and fight back into turn two. God, once again, something that was out of Florian Alt's hand pushing him back down the order, wasn't quite quick enough to go up the inside in turn two, and now he's got Edgar Pons right on his back wheel. Every single one of these riders in the top four will fancy their chances of perhaps getting an upset. Edgar Pons, all of a sudden, is right in the frame, and he knows that if he could get past Florian Al and win the race, that would be second place for him overall in the series. But we've got more back markers coming up. Let's just hope they get out of the way a little bit more than before, because it would be a shame to see the race decided by one of those errors. But we certainly have a race on our hands going into these five final five turns. Yep, there you see a few riders moving out of the way, but there's still more danger up ahead. Jesko Raffin trying to round off his 2014 season as champion and the winner of the final race of the season. Florian out there, who led for so long, has got a bit on his plate here. And Edgar Pons there, that's really not helped him. He nearly ran straight in the back of a tail ender, and I think that's his chance gone. Florian out though, is still fighting to try and win this race. He doesn't necessarily need to at this point, but he won't really realize that. Out, out is still safe, but no, that was a complete completely held up going into turn 10 and turn 11 I think that's curtains for for Edgar Pons there but you wonder is Alt going to try anything up the inside going into the final turn down into turn 13 for the last time and Alt is going to just try and out drag Jesko Raffin to the line I don't think he's got enough he's not close enough Dylan it is going to be Jesko Raffin the 2014 champion wins the final race of the season here ahead of Florian Alt who's confirmed second overall Edgar Pons is absolutely distraught with third because he's probably fancy his chances of winning that at one point. Oh, definitely, definitely. You know, he's going to be upset with the back markers, but I think Alt, Alt will argue, well, that, that was just as considering what, what happened to him with the back marker when he was leading the race with Raffin behind. It's just one of those situations. It's, it's unavoidable. No back marker ever wants to get in the way, but it's so, so tough when you're pushing at your maximum and there are guys that are just quicker. You know, you know what are you going to do? You've got to try as hard as you can, but look, Florian Alt, second in the championship, considering he was taken out last time out in Portimao, lost the chance to fight for the title, but considering that, you've got to be pretty happy with second place. Yeah, I'm sure uh, all of these guys, they all look a little bit uh, disconsolate, don't they, after maybe not getting that chance to win. It's Edgar Pons, though, there in third. Uh, he looked uh, rather upset there. It just didn't quite fall for him in the right time, but... He did get stuck behind his teammate for such a long period of this race. Jesko Raffin, though, in the end, proving why he is Moto2 champion. He's smooth and he pounced just when he needed to. And just had those reserves, didn't he? Had those reserves. Like you said, he had that smooth riding style, conserved his tyres. Yes, of course, he made he made the most of uh, he made the most of the back markers. He really did. He capitalised on it. But just because you're in front doesn't mean it's easy to uh, to uh, stay in front. And he really he got the hammer down. Al just Al just couldn't get close enough. This season, Jesko Raffin, whenever he's visited the podium, it's always been on the top step, and he's done the same again here. That is why he is the. Uh, FIM CEV Repsol Moto2 champion and we're looking forward to seeing what he produces uh, next season when he moves into the world championship. Yeah, very happy, very happy Pons team there to take another victory. I think I may have spotted Louis Salom in there early on. I certainly can see his, uh, see his mum in the box. So we seem to have a few famous world championship faces here egging on their, their teammates. Also, these guys are going to be here for a test on, uh, on Monday and Tuesday as well, which is why we'll see probably more, more familiar famous faces than we normally do. But today is all about this man, Jesko Raffin, the race winner. The winner, the champion of 2014, Jesko Raffin, gets his sixth victory of the season. Florian Alt, that's his sixth to second place of the season. Edgar Pons finishing in third place there and third. So your top three in the championship are right there in front of your eyes. Stephen Odendahl finishing in fourth. Javi Fier here, well, it could have been a different day for him uh, were it not for that mistake earlier on. He finishes in fifth ahead of Valentin de Bees. Then it's Dakota Mamola. And the uh, top superstar, uh, Bernard Thibault, um, they're showing once again why he's won that championship. Then in 10th, we have Mikel Pons ahead of Luca Vitali in 12th. Angel Poyatos in 13th play. Francisco Ilgado, Alexi Sira, uh, sorry, excuse me, Sira Roll in 14th place. Excellent racing then from the Moto2 team and the Pons team absolutely delighted. The gold helmet has worked out a treat here.
And, uh, well, it'd be interesting to see how he gets on. He's got that sort of... I wouldn't say it's an unorthodox style, but that smooth style is not something you see so much in the Moto2 paddock. No, no, and generally it's paid off not having that smooth style, if you know what I mean. I do honestly believe that he's going to have to adapt a little bit, maybe maybe take a few tips from, from Edgar Pons about that whole backing the bike into the corners, because that's something which we've seen work to, uh, to, to great effect. But of course, we never know, because Dunlop tyres develop as well. So we'll um, no, but it'll, it'll certainly be, be fascinating to, to see how he goes with that SAG team. And I believe we now have, should have Tony down in Parc Ferme having a word with our champion and today's race winner. Gracias, Corrafin. Tal y como comentábamos en la parrilla, no hay mejor manera para celebrar tu título y cerrar tu paso por el FIMTEP Repsol que con una victoria aquí en tu última carrera en Valencia. Sí, claro, es muy grande ganar aquí después de un fin de semana como Portimao, que no todos han creído que me lo merezco y todo eso, pero ahora puedo enseñar que me merezco este título y sí, eh, era muy buen, bonita la car carrera porque había siempre otro piloto adelante mío y no era muy fácil y sí, muy contento y ahora el lunes a los tres con el Mundial. A celebrarlo, gracias. gracias. So let's have a look then at the highlights of that race. And it is, uh, well, an interesting final day. Javi Vieje, it was that started on pole position. Jesko Raffin, the champion, second on the grid. And Steven Odendahl looking for his first victory, uh, third on the grid. Down into turn one. It was a really good start from the South African, though. Number 44, Odendahl got the advantage up ahead of Miroslav Popov, who came from nowhere to get a great start. But then Raffin managed to get himself out ahead. There was a big crash further back. Anatesha almost knocking himself out, literally, over at turn 13. Raffin it was that led then from Javi Vieje. Ran wide, though, out of turn four, allowing Vieje through to take the lead with Odendahl in third and Miroslav Popov in fourth place as Alex Rins was watching on. Then down into turn one, you see here, losing the front end, Miroslav Popov was backing his uh, machine in, trying to make progress and absolutely furious with that. It's a sad day at the office for him. The air hit continued to lead number 97 up ahead there, Roald and Dahl, who managed to get himself into second and then third for Jesko Raffin. And then down into turn one, a mistake here, running really wide for Vieje. He was never able to recapture his form and get up with the group. And this at that particular time put Odendahl into the lead and in line to perhaps win his first race. Raffin there in second place was soon able to capitalize, but Florian Al, having not started the race that well, had gone from sixth to fifth to fourth and now up into second place with Raffin in third, and Edgar Pons desperately needing to finish ahead of Alt in fourth place, number 57. Then Alt made his move, a lovely move up the inside into turn eight, ahead of uh, Odendahl. Raffin in third place, Edgar Pons in fourth. Further back, we saw Corey Turner there absolutely destroy his bike, and a number of other fallers, sadly, going out of the race here in Valencia. Florian Alt looked like he might just be in control though. As we got to the closing stages of this race, it was all elbows. Back markers came into play. Jesko Raffin managed to take advantage. The Moto2 champion for 2014 went up the inside of the German. And on the final lap, it was really close. Unfortunately, though, another back marker getting in the way there of third place man Edgar Pons. And Alt could not catch the race winner across the line. It was number 10. Jesko Raffin then with the race win, the champion of 2014 with his gold helmet there. And second place was Florian Alt. And third was Edgar Pons. That is, in fact, your top three in the championship overall as they prepare themselves to get onto the podium. And I think quite an emotional Jesko Raffin in Parc Ferme. He said after the, uh, after the race in Portimao where he finished sixth, he said a few people said he maybe didn't deserve the uh, title. And he says, well, look, I've now shown you I can win these races. So uh, I think he uh, I think he was certainly happy to maybe silence a few of those critics. Certainly, yeah. He's the... Uh Thibault, I believe, the super stock winner, also up on the podium. Uh, Frenchman. 
Yeah, finishing eighth there. That's uh, that's fantastic within a you know within a group of experienced Moto2 riders to be up there. That's uh, no no certainly a fantastic performance there. Yeah, not bad at all. Third place then. And uh, oh, sorry, Thibio will get his trophy first. Or not? They're no, not no, quite. The can't con quite make up their mind. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the uh, that's the con constructors' trophy going going to the team, going to the Pons team. So uh, now we have the trophy for for Thibaut. Yeah, it's uh, Bertin Thibault that uh, it is that wins it. 26 year old. Just crowned the Superstock 600 champion actually for the CEV for 2014. Uh, place for Edgar Pons. Oh, and here we have Jack Miller, the man that just lost out on the Moto3 title but won the race here, handing out the trophy to Edgar Pons. Number of GP riders yes. here this weekend, which is <laughs> nice to see. And Maverick Vinales here. The uh, well, not not no. He was third in the Moto2 class, but obviously rookie of the year. They certainly Jesko Raffin can look towards Vinales as a bit of an example of how to do in your rookie year in in the World Championship. The win though going to the champion Jesko Raffin, and he's proved his critics wrong. Well done to him, champion, six times winner this year. Maybe, just maybe, you might have to start familiarising yourself with that Swiss national anthem as Jesko Raffin makes his way onto the world scene for 2015 but ends 2014 on a high. The champion race winner here in Valencia ahead of Florian Alt and Edgar Potts. So here we have the final championship standings. Jesko Raffin, the winner, the championship winner now by full 35 points ahead of Florian Alt in second. Edgar Pons not quite enough in the tank to take that second place ahead of Xavi Vierge. Stephen Odendahl in fifth ahead of Alan Tesha, our crasher today. Sebastian Porto in seventh, obviously unable to race here this race weekend. Angel Poyatos and in front of Miroslav Popov in ninth and tenth place. We then have the Italian Luca Vitali ahead of Russell Gomez. Mikel Pons, no relation to Edgar Pons. Francisco Higaro in 13th. Dakota Momola in 14th place. Probably not a reflection of his true capabilities. Federico Fuligni, Bastian Chizo, Alejandro Medina and in 18th place Diego Perez.